and a very happy Christmas to you all from all of us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I need to remind myself often and especially at Christmas that the things which bring me gladly to Mass every day here are not always in the minds of everyone who happens to come to church. It's inevitable that when I come to church I come full of assumptions about what we're doing here. Others come, as is natural, with more or less interest in those same things, and all are welcome. And the place to start, surely, at this season is that word, welcome. If we're going to celebrate something, we need to be invited. We need to know that we are eagerly gathered in. At the heart of Christmas, the celebration of Jesus being born as one of us is the assertion that we are all welcome with God. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, and I go before you to pre prepare a place for you, he says to us. We hear those words of Jesus at many funerals, but they signal a relationship which starts here today. How do we know we're welcome with God? Because he made the effort to invite us how did he do that? He joined us in our humanity so that he could speak words that we understand in a voice that is authentic to us. That's the point of John's unexpected and beautiful poetic opening to his gospel. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We don't usually attend parties of strangers though even if we were crashing this one, we'd still be welcome. We usually get to attend gatherings where we share or think we share common ground with <coughs> others present. To demonstrate that common ground, having sent messages via various imperfect human messengers, the prophets, God sent his own son, the most authentic message and invitation he could send. If we want people to come to a party, we don't send a stranger with the invitation unless we are very grand and commanding people. That's the second thing to say. Rather than being grand and commanding, God is precisely God with us, as Isaiah proclaims. People, including many Christians, have sometimes characterized God as a scary monarch or dictator. But as important as that sense of welcome is that God comes not just to, but among us. He is with us, without claiming status. This is not the God Emperor from Rome deigning to notice his subjects from afar, providing a sort of peace, the Pax Romana, which is peace as the world gives, but not the peace of God which passes all understanding. God comes to us in the poorest, the most marginal, the least powerful person we can imagine, a child born in dubious circumstances to a young Jewish girl in a remote and unprepossessing corner of the Roman Empire. There is no human experience too degraded, too marginal, too despised, by the respectable and powerful of the world for God. He tells us that he will feel at home in that place above all. His invitation, his personal invitation, this is the point of Christmas, reaches beyond any of the boundaries familiar to us or created by us. So many of Jesus' parables and encounters are about breaking down boundaries and taboos that we still set up to feel good about ourselves. Think of the Pharisee and the tax collector, or the Good Samaritan, or the woman with the hemorrhage rendering her unclean, whom Jesus still will touch, the Gentile centurion who asked for his servant's healing, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, as we repeat when we come up to communion. That other Gentile centurion by the cross who recognizes Jesus when his friends still haven't quite got it. Truly, this was the Son of God. They all get in. 
When I was rector of Berkhamsted in Hertfordshire, more than once I heard people say how fortunate they were not to live in Hemel Hempstead. God does not honour that sentiment. He does live in Hemel Hempstead. Citizens of Westminster need to know that he does live south of the river, that we meet him in the woman who's sleeping every night across the road on the Jesus Army steps. As an Australian, I affirm that God even lives in New Zealand. <laughs> God joined in our lives. He joined in the lives of people whose lives we have never met or understood personally in order that it could never be said that God's invitation wasn't open to all. So, third and last, you've come here this morning, all of you, in the middle of, a win of winter without benefit of public transport. That means that you've responded to an invitation at some level. And God's question to all of us this morning is, will you stay for the party? Will you enjoy it? This party is not quite like Christmas drinks. This is a party without a fixed guest list, one which is not time limited. It is eternal in its reach and utterly inclusive in its invitation. The only people not included are those who don't respond, including people who think they're entitled to be there but make no effort. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him, we've just heard. This is a feast of life and freedom, yet many don't come. Sometimes, of course, we, the church, are to blame. We don't always offer that invitation very well. Life and freedom aren't always obviously enough on offer. We all need to try harder. But as in the creation of any relationship, people also have to say yes. They have to be ready to come. And our part is to keep asking as generously as we can. Since you've all turned up this morning, I assume you know you're welcome. I hope you're also enjoying yourself and maybe will help someone else to respond to God's invitation in the year ahead. The postscript is that I'm told that our bar will be open briefly, or not too briefly, I hope, after Mass today. In keeping with the premise of this sermon, if you're not a member of it, then one of us will buy you a drink. <laughs>